Well, hello, <clears throat> that's me again. It's Saturday, um, August 6th, and let me show you something here which you will need to understand what I'm going to be talking about today. Here's the <clears throat> scheme, so to speak, presented by none other than uh, Anglophone uh, uh, military naval analysts uh, of the uh, Soviet Navy's exercises in 1985. And those exercises, the strategic exercises and deployment of the Soviet Navy, as you can see yourself, represents a classic, classic uh, uh, pincer movement, the idea of which was to prevent the United States of the supply to NATO European allies in case NATO starts the war, then Soviet Union reacts, attacks NATO, drives it to whatever, and obviously Soviet Navy was conducting their uh, operations on preventing the <coughs> US Navy and its uh, strategic lift uh, to provide some <coughs> um, supplies to its NATO allies. Because of that, there was, of course, this incredibly important and uh, tremendously important batch of operations, actually. It's not one operation. There were like, all kinds of operations NATO would uh, perform at the famous Gug Gap, and it was in the 80s, and the Gug Gap is Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom Gap, as you can see yourself, where, in accordance to, which was the case, actually, uh, to uh, NATO's and United States Navy doctrine, the Soviet submarine force will make the breakthrough into the open of Atlantic, and where all those sources and anti-submarine warfare forces uh, have been allocated by NATO, for, uh, including uh, basing on the Keflavik, uh, uh, the base, air base Keflavik in Iceland, and it still exists there today, but uh, I don't think so. They, uh, there are any plans to return this base to any kind of operational thing. But here is the important uh, point which I want to make here, because obviously uh, I introduced this um, old, really old thing, uh, so to speak, for a reason. Because, <clears throat> of course, it was in 1985, things changed. We literally lived, uh, lived through two generations of the political change or geopolitical change in the world. And let me uh, give you another thing which I want to stress here. Here's a uh, rather very uh, important and excellent, actually, despite obviously being uh, politically absolutely full of crap, but, I mean, in terms of tactical and operational matters, uh, Andrew Metric, uh, three years ago, in proceedings, respectable American U.S. Naval uh, Institute uh, um, publication, he wrote about that unlike what I showed you, and especially those massive anti-submarine warfare in, uh, um, in Giuk Gap, he writes that unmind the gap, stop paying attention to this gap, and he explains it this way. The Giuk Gap was a vital anti-submarine warfare choke point during the Cold War, but countering the Russian undersea challenge today requires integrated open ocean capabilities. Uh, I'm stressing open ocean capabilities. And that's what he introduces uh, this. Of course, it's funny, but hey, he has to. In the past few years, Russian submarine activities have become a focal point for U.S. and NATO planners, uh, part of the larger discourse on Russia's revanchist role in the wake of its illegal annexation of Crimea. Obviously, we can laugh and say what have you about Russia's revanchist role. It is not really revanchist. It's actually turning the world into a more sane place after basically the war crimes and crimes against humanity committed for the last almost 30 years by uh, NATO and combined West around the globe. But hey, if it's revanchist, it's revanchist. But that's the way they view it, nothing I can do about it. But look what he writes in uh, when he explains why the uh, due gap absolutely meaningless today. Uh, here's his uh, parts from his article. <clears throat> and here it is. The importance of land attack weapons to Russian naval power is evident in the inclusion of nearly every new design vessel the Russian Navy has commissioned in the past five years. 
he speaks about yes and then of course he makes this laughable comparison and he says for example uh, modernized they plan then they are modernizing it now oscar two class to carry up to 96 uh, calibers this last step would give the russian navy a capability akin to that of the u.s ohio class ssgm you know that four ohio class uh, strategic missile submarines have been uh, converted to uh, uh, 152 i believe they carry uh, uh, tomahawk carrying uh, uh, guided missile submarines but of course this is a reasonable comparison because obviously the only thing they can carry those are highest uh, ssgms uh, are uh, tomahawks which are nearing their obsolescence uh, their um, modernized Russian Navy Oscar IIs, they not carry just calibers which are much newer and much more potent than Tomahawks. They obviously carry things of such nature as Onyx and Zircon. And here United States doesn't even come into the picture and that is why this comparison is funny. But again, listen, it's purely operational matter. Let's wait the salvo. Okay, they have the salvos 152 uh, Tomahawks let's say okay against Russia most of them they will not go through so there will be some leakers maybe but <clears throat> but look what he writes <clears throat> and that is important that is competent for example a submarine launch cruise missile submarine SLCM with the range of 1,000 miles would give the Russian Navy a potential patrol area of 100,000 square miles from which it could strike Bre Bremenhaven while remaining reasonably secure. An SLCM with an ocean range of 1,250 miles would increase the likely patrol area to more than 220,000 square miles, including waters north and west of the island of Yan Mayan, 50 plus miles from the nearest NATO anti-submarine warfare base. Yes, and uh, here's another thing, of course, because uh, all Russian submarines, diesel submarines, are now carrying their cal calibers, and of course, most of Russian nuclear submarines, especially in Northern Fleet, they do carry uh, calibers too. And uh, that also means that it's not just uh, the salvo itself, it means also a very large counter anti-submarine warfare on uh, Russian part, being able to secure those of already very large areas for operation of Russian submarines and that means not only the submarines, Russian submarines defending the uh, submarines which, which launch the missiles, it also means Russian aviation being able to push out or just shut, uh, shoot down directly any kind of the uh, anti-submarine warfare uh, aviation from NATO countries. Granted that they will move it to Keflavik again and you know something they will perform some kind of searches, but you can look my past videos about the, what search is and what are the probabilities of the uh, search in the anti-submarine warfare. So this is kind of explanation of, of what is NATO facing. And the reason I made this uh, introduction is very simple. And it's really funny because yesterday some of the morons from Washington Post and again uh, any uh, U.S. Uh, mainstream media org uh, and rag, be that New York Times, Washington Post, Chicago, what have you, they don't have any uh, normal military experts there and those people who give them their opinions, they are not experts either because obviously they are from this uh, triumphalist school which, you know, remembers how they beat the crap out of the third-rate Arab military and they still kind of live with that. Oh, and in this particular case, you begin to, which uh, not only me but I'm the one of the first who started to say that you know what now I do have issues and I do have doubts about military competence of America's top brass and in Pentagon because evidently what we see today uh, in Ukraine and uh, it is not a secret uh, United States and UK are practically in direct control and command of the Ukrainian forces and not to mention providing them ISR and let me tell you they p perform themselves as really clowns I mean this is not serious and I'll be talking about it which really calls in doubt their military education and military skills but that is a separate issue but the reason I brought it all up including you is this and yesterday this uh, clown what's his name uh, one of those Josh Rogan I believe or what, what have you Nyakon you know fanboy uh, 
published about uh, something like in Twitter that the United States can still, you know, do the two theater war. Well, it is really funny because uh, actually it uh, uh, gets us into this piece of uh, uh, news, so to speak. And this was on the February 28th, four days after Russia starts a special military operation. And look at this. It's written by David Brunstorm and Michael Martina. And they talk about U.S. can focus on two theaters in the Pacific and war in Europe, officials say. You remember those first days when Russia was running out of everything and was demoralized and was sustaining 10,000 killed a day, you know, in accordance to, uh, you know, uh, key of uh, information. And, uh, but look at this. Here they obviously ask this guy who is, his name is Kurt Campbell, and he tells them at that time, it's difficult, you, you know, to be the two theater power which United States is. It is expensive, but it is also essential, and I believe that we are entering a period where that is what we will be demanded of the United States and this generation of Americans, the official Kurt Campbell told, and the event hosted for some, whatever, Nyakon uh, uh, gathering of the, uh, you know, uh, military ignorance who pretend that they know how to fight the, uh, uh, generally any kind of war. But look at this. The two-third doctrine, uh, two-third of operations doctrine, it, it's, it's a long, long story with the United States, especially after the, uh, the beating the crap out of Saddam's army and thinking that the United States is the finest uh, fighting force, I'm quoting Obama, in history. Obviously, this finest uh, fighting force never really faced a real uh, serious enemy, but hey, w w what am I to talk about Obama? He was a huge specialist in military. And so look at this. This uh, this is from 2001, Strategic Forum uh, magazine, and uh, it's uh, uh, about two medium-sized operations elsewhere, you know, or this amounts to a new strategic calculus in 2001 of one plus one half plus one half contingencies, and they talk about this two major theater wars, two MTWs, you know, as if that, yeah, United States can do this, hooray, you know, so... Yeah, it's a long story. It's been actually in uh, gestation and in discussion for decades in the United States because the United States considers itself so uh, powerful militarily. But look at this. About the guy who on this Todd Campbell. Here's him. You see, that's Todd Campbell. And uh, let's look at this guy, Education. I picked it up from the um, uh, uh, was a Wikipedia, and here it is. Kurt Michael Campbell was born on August 27, 57. He received a Bachelor of Art from the University of California, San Diego, a certificate in music and political philosophy from the University of Yerevan in Soviet Armenia. In other, uh, in other words, he received the PhD in being an uh, auto mechanic gynecologist and a doctorate in international relations from Bresenau's College, Oxford, on a Marshall Scholarship. So the guy basically, if you look at this and knowing what is the uh, nowadays Anglo-American uh, uh, education and all those uh, spheres, he has zero uh, competences to pass on, uh, you know, uh, 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 tactics of platoon, motor rifle platoon in offense or defense, let alone uh, speaking about strategic issues and especially the uh, two major power, uh, major wars, theaters and things of this nature. In other words, the guy is absolute uh, ignoramus. He probably rubbed shoulder in State Department and whatever. And in Pentagon with this big uh, top brass, uh, gathers those rumors, whatever those generals tell him. And he says, oh yeah, we can do the two, you know, major wars and let's kind of fight both, you know, Russia and uh, China. Well, sure, sure, and as you can see yourself, I showed you all everything you need to know about this for the introduction. But, of course, the, rea the reality is such that the United States will not be able to fight at a freaking single European theater with serious power, and we're talking about, of course, about Russia. And that's the situation, especially against the background of China, and China, well, 
again, I say that I'm sick and tired of listening to these critics. Oh, you demean China. Oh, you, you know, underestimate China. No, I'm not in the business of saying pleasantries. I respect China's immense achievements, and especially lifting from the, uh, uh, poor, you know, misery and, you know, huge, basically 700 million people of the, you know, being poor and absolutely, you know, uh, uh, insolvable financially to some kind of degree of prosperity and, you know, future, you know, um, the, some future for their children and themselves economically and, you know, just in life. It's amazing achievement, uh, unprecedented, really. And so Chinese econo economic development is huge, and I respect it tremendously. But again, please, I mean, uh, let me talk about the military issues here, okay? And I'm talking, uh, I'm not into pleasantries here. For example, if Russia sucks at something, and she does suck at some issues, yeah, I will say, yeah, Russians suck here. There are some issues there. So, but when uh, I, I can tell you that uh, China is not the military superpower yet, uh, it's true not because I want it, but because it is what it is. And uh, against the background of China and being humiliated by Nancy Pelosi's visit, uh, much of it is was self-inflicted by Chinese, actually. So you can immediately see the reaction, which was absolutely predicted, and immediately you could have expected it, uh, expected it and I spoke about it. Here it is, you know. Uh, China weighs in on strategic operation with Russia immediately after the visit visit of Pelosi and she, that's what Wang Yi, Minister of Foreign Affairs of China says uh, yesterday, Russia has been consistently upholding the one China principle standing against any encroachment on our country's sovereignty and Beijing is ready to strengthen strategic cooperation with the Russian Federation so we could more effectively defend an international system where the UN would pay, uh, play the key role and on uh, order based on the norms of international law. Uh, translated into the uh, uh, human language, layman's language, no, from diplomatic, it means only one thing. China is not ready to fight militarily and counter the United States in full. Russia is, and uh, Russia was doing this for the last eight years uh, with different types of maneuvering, but here it is. We'll look at the, uh, this uh, special military operation, and you already know that ch Chinese officers are involved directly now with Russia's general staff. Obviously, China is obviously a participant on, on those major Russian uh, military exercises, including coming Vostok 2022. China again will be full-blown participant of those maneuvers. So, and uh, it all comes down to the fact that Russia is the guarantor of the Eurasian uh, uh, economic integration uh, security. She simply is. And that's what uh, comes down to this, to theater, to major theater wars. Can the United States take on China in terms of naval force and naval operation in and around Taiwan? I already stated, yes, she can. Will uh, United States sustain uh, uh, severe losses? Most likely. But it can still win in conventional, so to speak, uh, framework or deal a serious political and military political defeat on China by means of, hey, uh, let me put it this way, uh, there will be a lot of uh, Chinese surface assets which will be sunk. And that can have an horrendous ideological and cultural shock, it sends shock to Chinese society, and uh, we have to speak about this obviously separately, but that's what I'm talking about. And uh, basically the United States was speaking a lot about the ability to fight in uh, uh, two theaters, major theaters, Europe and in the Pacific. We have to face the fact that the United States cannot fight in Europe, period. First, it will not be able in real war to de de deliver forces which the United States doesn't have, and in all, unless, of course, the United States declares the uh, full mobilization in the United States to fight, fight those damn Ruskies. But hey, good luck trying to declare that in the United States, and I'm sure considering the level of the, uh, basically, the lowest level of U.S. Uh, military personnel, especially uh, those recruits, in generations, yeah, good luck, you know, so apart from the fact that, as I already stated, uh, unlike China, Russia has already a gi gigantic salvo of anti-shipping and uh, uh, um, strategic land attack missiles, which will basically make it impossible uh, or reduce or mitigate tremendously 
any kind of the delivery of the forces, which, by the way, the United States, United States doesn't have. The actual combat strength of United States ground forces, with once you consider everything, is pretty around something like 500,000 combat troops. Uh, good luck trying to fight this major war with Russia with 500,000 troops. Yeah, I'm not talking about NATO. Let's cut the crap here. And, uh, you know, as I already stated, so forget the European theater. And the only theater United States can get anything out is, of course, the Pacific. And again, uh, the United States definitely has a world-class Navy, again, and despite the fact that, obviously, the uh, issue of the surface force in the United States uh, Navy is a serious issue. There are huge problems there. Uh, submarine force is the world-class, and it is a strategic factor. And that is why United States have been also proposing AUKUS, and which would come down to uh, basically basing uh, uh, United States submarines in Perth, Australia, which allows them immediately to deploy easily into the uh, Indian Ocean and will be a little bit out of the range of the uh, Chinese ballistic missiles, which could have otherwise struck the like uh, Diego Garcia what have you uh, 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 areas or bases where the uh, American submarines can go and are based so that's the main reason so yes United States can uh, do probably uh, the one theater it cannot do two it's absolute fantasy it's absolute pardon my French, bullshit created in the, you know, inflated uh, in the flamed fantasy of all those, uh, you know, uh, international relations and political science majors who would know shit from Shinola, pardon my French again, and who still pretend that they can uh, pass their judgments on the issue of military power and uh, uh, military balance. And that is exacerbated by the fact, which we already now have to speak about directly, that, hey, when you look at how all those UK and American people plan operations of WSU and what a freaking mess the situation is in Kiev. Uh, you have to again start that, guys, this is not Iraq. You don't have half a year. Well, they had eight years to prepare for uh, defense against all those nasty Ruskies. But again, uh, I can only quote one of my friends, the Colonel of Russian General Staff and Central Apparatus, who stated, they're not going to outthink us. And yeah, I know. The United States has a valiant and beautiful, you know, glorious naval history. In terms of combined arms warfare, well, come on, guys. I mean, there are some successes, but it's nowhere near Russian uh, uh, experience with planning gigantic operations and especially when you consider the World War II which whose history was uh, uh, rewritten by English and American so-called historians for a reason and again when you have a uh, general Patton as your idol in tank warfare that that's no surprise then you cannot do any much real in real war and that's the issue and yes this morning basically uh, Elden Air forces which are primarily militias obviously supported by a Russian firepower in terms of artillery and uh, aviation and other things they already pretty much uh, liberated Marienka, one of the main uh, uh, centers where human, shield was, uh, human shields were used, which was basically providing the fire or artillery and other attacks on Donetsk against civilians. So it's it's going fine, you know, and uh, Russian troops themselves, I mean per se, that means uh, regular Russian troops are primarily concentrated at Kherson and Kharkov just to keep the uh, line there, and Russia didn't even engage in full blown on combat uh, uh, combined arms operations and when she will you will know but hey this is just the little talk about the um, this uh, two major theaters war or two and obviously uh, let's face it neither NATO is not ready to fight Russia and it cannot without sustaining catastrophic defeat and losses which United States never experienced in its history and yeah when this Campbell dude you know he talks about that new generation of Americans again read my lips when you're gonna be getting in the real scale war with Russia, about 1,000 to 1,200 KIAs alone, 
uh, see what's going to happen in the United States because you cannot find those, find, uh, I mean, uh, cannot uh, hide those type of losses. And finally, it begins to break through. <clears throat> and that's why. <clears throat> Uh, six days ago, suddenly uh, we have not only Amnesty International uh, report about the atrocities Ukraine commits against Russia, Russophone, uh, 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 Russophone population, and basically, ha, finally this uh, whore house organization uh, found what everybody was pointing out to, to them for the last several months. Obviously, they didn't do it on their own volition. That is command from Washington and London to start to what it means abandon Ukraine. But now we have obviously even <clears throat> uh, sensational uh, 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 Corey Bernardis of Sky News, uh, basically re revelations about the fact that Zelensky basically fooled. Well, he didn't fool. They knew it all along. But the fact that Zelensky and uh, his uh, cabal well, controlled by Washington and London, but he d doesn't say this, but at least, hey, good start, that if this cabal con conducted basically what amounts to genocide of Russian population, and that basically everything what has been told in uh, Western media about uh, uh, war in Ukraine is primarily BS, but I'm on record from the start that all of it is BS, so now you have the, this major British <coughs> network and... <coughs> Uh, with millions of subscribers basically saying that yeah it's all bs it's all crap they are criminals they you know they you know just basically oppress uh, uh, a russian popular russophone population in ukraine and russia was pretty much you know <clears throat> It uh, was uh, uh, basically pressed into interfering, but hey, uh, that's a little bit of, so to speak, uh, revelations uh, which are coming uh, uh, f towards the Western public because obviously narrative has has to change now, and especially those people in Pentagon who do have brains, and there are some uh, who are professionals who understand what is going on and who understand this all uh, fluffy rhetoric uh, uh, about the two major wars and you know United States been capable to do this or that as a complete BS, which is just, you know, uh, 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 chest thumping, they uh, see what is going on and probably their uh, basically sober voices started to get through both White House and Downing Street 10 or what have you and they understood that it's time to really get out while it's not too late until the whole thing will be, uh, you know, blamed on them and now, obviously, they're preparing public opinion that Zelensky will be, uh, uh, you know, fall guy and that, yeah. So, and, yeah, we're still waiting for this funny uh, Kherson counteroffensive. Sure, they might mount something, you know, like suicidal attack. Sure, they will. Okay, we'll see what happens. Uh, Russia has all firepower and, again, most of Russian troops are not even engaged. So... But one of the most important things which I want to point out to you, among all those events, so to, to speak, of the last week, which I'm uh, trying to make sense to, for you and to myself, uh, here's the thing. This is a, a major Turkish um, <clears throat> uh, uh, polling agency, Areda, and it's, uh, you can look it up, it's last year. Exactly uh, one year ago, they d conducted this poll among Turks and they were asking uh, basically comparative questions. You can easily find it, uh, just dial array, uh, you know, type array in Google and you'll get it. And they were uh, uh, basically asking their uh, very simple uh, issue, uh, question what uh, and how you will uh, approach the, you know, or assess the uh, relations. Uh, between uh, uh, Russia and Turkey. <clears throat> At that time, 58% <clears throat> of Turks, <clears throat> uh, they stated that uh, Ru they view Russia as a strategic partner. Something like 15 other or 18%, I don't remember, they said that the relations are very good. Only 11% said that they were not good. But in their uh, major turn of events, when Areda asked, what do you think? Uh, well, whom should Turkey ally itself as strategic partner, United States or Russia? Well, look at this diagram. 
78.9, well, 79% of Turks stated that Turkey has to become an ally, strategic ally of Russia. And only 21% stated that they want strategic relations with the United States. That basically explains to you why these relations with, uh, between Putin and Erdogan, between Russia and Turkey, still continue. They go on and on and here it is. Yesterday, Erdogan in Sochi with Putin, and they have a warmest uh, <clears throat> of the communications. Obviously, part of it is <clears throat> have been <clears throat> behind closed doors. But if you look attentively at their uh, common uh, communique, the statement, and what they discussed, oh my gosh, guys, I mean, it's, uh, it's Turkey, all right? They are not stupid there. They can see what is going on in Europe. Turks love their air conditioners. Come on. They love also Russian tourists. They love Russian energy. And uh, evidently, they will be loving even more Russian mil military toys. And it's probably not going to be just S-400. Erdogan was <clears throat> very explicit a few months ago that, yeah, Su-35 looks good, you know, uh, uh, Su-57 also looks good, and S-500 looks good. So make your own conclusion. And when you have the public which is so much in favor uh, in Russian-Turkish relations, <clears throat> You have to consider that <clears throat> Russia is not as uh, uh, isolated as Mr. Blinken tries us to believe. So, and that's what I wanted to tell you about trying to mix to the doing this off the cuff, you know, almost improvisation about here's the, you know, operational tactical data. This is how it influences political decisions. And yes, I will repeat it again and read my lips. United States cannot fight two major theaters. And the only theater United States has now to consider is in the Pacific, it's against China. And that is why Wang Yi, which is speaking on behalf of uh, obviously Chinese uh, top elite, is ready, so to speak, of expansion, uh, and actually pretty dramatic expansion of uh, co <coughs> cooperation between Russia and China. And don't forget, China, that's the thing which many people don't like me to point out. China was a good boy, so to speak, uh, of the United States because Chinese were really good at following sanctions on Russia, except, of course, for the energy. So let's uh, cut the crap and see the picture for what it is. But it is inevitable that Pelosi, while winning tactically and, you know, just basically humiliating China for a short period of time, sustained a strategic defeat because now we will be seeing some major shifts in real alliance between Russia and China. And this is a very, very bad news for both United States and Europe, though I don't know if Europe can see, have any good news at all. So this was my talk for today. It was off the cuff. It was improvisation, but this is kind of food for thought for you for the weekend. And as always, those who like what I do, please subscribe. And those who can afford, please uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, support me on the Patreon. And that is pretty much it for today, guys. I'll talk to you later. Have a fun weekend. Bye-bye.